Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Fall 33 Grace Series talk. This is our second talk this semester. I'm Anjum Chida. I'm a member of Grace Series Committee. The committee is run by Mehra. She should be right there. <laughs> She's not. And then uh, Giti is also a member. And we also have Honorable Professor Bhavani as a member. So we do this as a team. Uh, these uh, Grace Series talks are designed to inspire and empower women and other non-binary individuals in the field of computer science. Through these talks, uh, we aim to introduce role models who can ignite a sense of aspiration among our students. Like That's our aim. Today, we are fortunate to have one such distinguished role model and speaker, Diana Hennel, uh, who embodies the qualities we seek to promote. Diana currently holds the position of Chief Technology Officer at Catalyst Corporate Credit Union. She has an extensive three-decade career. She and her team have played pivotal roles in the modernization of financial operation, all the way from check processing sector to the exploration of cryptocurrency applications for credit unions. She has a long list of technical expertise. I don't want to name every one of them. I don't want to be here longer than I'm needed. But I do want to mention that she has a Bachelor of Science degree in Math and Computer Science from Mount Union College and a Master of Science degree in Computer Science from University of Illinois. She recently received an award for Top Women in Technology by Dallas Business Journal. That's in March 2021, so pretty recent. Uh, in addition to her professional ac accomplishments, she is actively engaged with local community in many ways. She is serving as a board member of, of High Tech High Heels, an organization dedicated to advancing the presence of women in STEM fields. That's my introduction. So please uh, join me in welcoming Diana Hennel for this talk. Thank you very much. All right, so you're recording? Yes. You're okay. Fine. All right. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's good to be here tonight, and I'm glad that you guys made the time to come out. I, uh, as she may have said, I have two boys who are freshmen in college this year and who just went through their just went through their first round of midterms. So I understand the workload that you are putting off to be here for this hour. So I'm hoping that you'll you'll be able to take something away from it. So as I was getting ready to talk to you guys tonight, I was trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to present and how I wanted to present it. And so I turned to TED Talks to get some ideas on great topics to talk about. And I, I got sucked down a rabbit hole and probably watched 20 hours worth of, of TED Talks, just looking for patterns and trying to figure out what is the best way to, to present information? And I learned some things. I learned that TED Talks are basically 18 minutes of, of information. So if you take away 18 minutes worth of information from this talk, I'll be happy. I also learned that most of them don't use PowerPoint, which is awesome because I am graphically challenged. So I do have some slides, but you'll notice some repetition in my slides. I learned all kinds of other really cool things about kids and creativity and how body language plays a role in the workplace and how you should use vulnerability in the workplace to um, get ahead, all kinds of things. And I also learned that it's easy to be a good speaker. All you have to do is go out and do something that somebody's interested in but it didn't really tell me what I wanted to talk to you about. So your poor professors that are in the room talk to you every day and they're trying to teach you and prepare you for jobs that don't even exist today in the marketplace. Skills that we can't even conceive of using technologies that haven't even been invented yet. So their jobs are very, very difficult and I, I applaud all of them for doing what they do. So what I did decide to talk to you about was really the thing that I know the most about, which is myself and my journey 
and some of the things that, that I've learned along the way in my career. And so thus the, the title of my talk, Thriving Despite the Missteps to Become a CEO. So I'll share some of the, the, the ups and downs of my career, give you some insight into to things that I have learned along the way. But I wanna start with a poll. So all of you take out your phones, go to slido.com, you can either scan the QR code, although I do run a cybersecurity department as well, so I know that QR co codes are the new way to fish you. This is not a fish, it's, it really is safe. So the question is, what things do you think are most important to do to make a successful career? One or two words, phrases, you can answer more than once if you've got some great ideas. There's no right or wrong answers here. Perseverance, that's a great one. Time management and dedication. Integrity, I love that one. Ambition, the desire. Connections and networking. Now, these are great words, guys. This is going to make some good soup, let me tell you. Perseverance is, is up there a lot. So, yes, all of these things are important in your career and some of them I am gonna talk about along the way. So I wanna start with a European folklore. And I don't know how many of you have heard the folklore of stone soup. Anybody know the, the story of stone soup? Let's see, we've got one over here who knows the story of stone soup. So there are a variety of ways that, that, what, that it's told, but the basic premise is this. Two strangers walk into a town, and with them they're carrying a big soup pot. Think of it in like a cauldron. And they walk over by the river, and they build a small fire, and they fill the pot with water, and they get a couple of stones, and they put the stones in the pot. And then they stand there and watch it. And a curious villager comes over and says, hey, what are you doing? And they said, we're making stone soup. It's going to be delicious. Villager says, doesn't look very good. It's just got stones in there. And the strangers say, well, yeah, it would be a little better if we had some carrots. And the villager says, well, I probably have some of those at home. And if you're willing to share your soup with me, I will go get the carrots. They said, absolutely. And so he goes and he gets some carrots and he brings them back. And now they all stand around looking at the soup. And another villager comes over. And the stranger says, yeah, it's stone soup, but it would be a little better with potatoes. And so this continues throughout the day. And, you know, they get carrots and potatoes and celery and some salt and some meat. And somebody brings bread and bowls. And by the end of the day, they have a wonderful pot of soup that can be shared among the villagers. And so what they learned was that if everybody is willing to contribute something at the end of the day, you have something wonderful that you've shared with others along the way, and you have something to take away at the end. And so that's really the foundation for what I'm gonna talk about today. Your career is very much like stone soup. Along the way, you will add ingredients. I'm gonna talk about six ingredients that I think have been very important in my career. So the first one is knowing why you're there. So my very first job out of graduate school, I interviewed with a number of companies and I had a reasonably good idea of the kinds of things that I might be interested in doing. But I went to work, I went to interview with IBM and I met the, the department manager who, was, who would be my manager if I took that job. And she was amazing. She was dynamic and encouraging and she was just a person that I knew I could work for. And so I chose to go to work for IBM. I moved from Illinois to North Carolina. And the day I started, I walked in expecting to meet the person that I was so excited to, to work for. And it was an entirely different manager. IBM was very notorious for moving department managers around. So first thing I learned was never go to work for a company just because you like the manager. Make sure you like the work that you're actually gonna be doing. The other thing that I've learned about knowing why you were there 
is you're going to experience all, all different kinds of companies, big, medium, small, and all of them sort of have different personalities. There, there's things to like about small companies. You can get things done very quickly, but there's also more risk in a small company. Large companies, lots of opportunity to move around, lots of opportunity for upward mobility, but also a lot of bureaucracy. And those mid-sized companies sort of balance the, the big and the small, but they often limit your upward mobility. So you'll try out all of them probably along the way somewhere, but you'll find the one that works best for you. Lots of people really like working in big companies. I'm more of a mid-sized company person myself. The next thing about knowing why you were there is being passionate about the mission. So I've spent most of my career working for software development companies. And you know their goal is really to build software, to improve the lives of, of the people who's using the software, and maybe to bring some sort of business value that didn't exist before. But when I went to work for the, the current organization that I'm working in, I realized that, and it, it's a credit union, so I don't know how many of you are members of credit unions, but credit unions are different. So we are a not-for-profit organization, not to be comp compared to a non-profit organization. They are actually a different thing. We are a not-for-profit organization that's owned by our members. And so we don't have customers, we have members. And so everyone shares in the profits and the risk in our company. And the credit union movement, as we call it, is all about being in communities where people don't have other options for financial services. And so credit unions go into these smaller communities and bring banking services to the underbanked. And they're, they're really truly part of the community. And so, for example, when there is a natural disaster, credit unions are the first organizations there to give back to those communities and to help the people who have been affected by whatever disaster it was. And so for me, being part of a credit union, it actually has a personal connection. I feel like I, I'm doing something bigger than just going to work every day. The other part of knowing why you were there is, is your work-life balance. So are you living to work or are you working to live? And this really, really becomes important when you, you start thinking about having a family because there are lots of hard decisions that you have to make along the way. Uh, both my husband and I are uh, full-time working people. And as, as I mentioned, we have twin boys. And so along the way, you know, we've had to balance sharing that responsibility as a parent. And are you working in an organization where you have some flexibility? This is one of the things that we really learned during COVID is that work-life balance has become much more important to most of the people who work in our organizations. And I think it's, it's really been a great growth experience for, for all of us going through that. There was a lot of hard things that we learned along the way, but there's been some very positive things that have come out of it. And then the last thing that I learned sort of in this know why you were there <clears throat> is know when to leave. So you're going to get a lot of things out of every position that you go into. But when you stop getting something out of it every day, when it's when you've lost your passion or you don't enjoy the work anymore or you don't see any growth opportunity, then you need to you need to acknowledge that it's time to go and not be afraid to move on. So that's our first ingredient. Know why you're there. The next one, a lot of you put this in, in our, our um, poll at the beginning, and that's networking. And personally for me, and probably for a lot of you in here who are more introverted, this one is really hard. So the first thing I would tell you in the mentoring or in the networking area is find yourself a mentor or two or three throughout your career. Find somebody who you really respect somebody who can give you career guidance that you trust their opinion and, and they're not afraid to tell you the hard truth. I found a mentor in my second company 
um, after I went to work for IBM, I went to work for a small consulting company. And I went to work for a gentleman who was very open about providing feedback, which is actually very hard to find in a manager. And so, you know, we had, we had a relationship and he moved on at some point and took me with him. And this happened several times where he would go find a position, take me to the company. At some point along the journey, he continued to be my mentor, but he also ended up working for me, um, which was kind of odd. But to, to this day, uh, 30 years later, I still call him when I'm making big career decisions. And so having that person or people in your lives that you can bounce ideas off of is, is really critical. Um, networking is, is hard, but it's even harder and more important when you're unemployed or looking for that first job. So one of the most challenging times in my career, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, was the uh, uh, about a year where I was unemployed and looking for a job. And so I went way out of my comfort zone and researched companies that I thought I might wanna work for and just started cold calling on CEOs and CTOs in those companies, sending emails. And you're gonna get about a 90% non-response rate. People will just ignore you. But about five to 10% of those CEOs and CTOs responded in some way. And one of the most interesting lunches I've had in my life was with a film producer who took me to lunch and just gave me some advice on looking outside of my comfort zone. And I ended up working in a marketing company, which I never would have contemplated had I not had lunch with a stranger. And so I periodically just send them back an email and, and tell them, hey, this is what's happening in my career. So it's, it's really been a nice journey. Um, the other thing you have to remember about your network is you don't have to like everyone in your network, but you, have to res you should respect them. And so forming those relationships, even with people who think differently than you, is important. All right, so that's our next, next ingredient is networking. All right, so this one is my favorite. Um, part of what I have, have made in my made my mission in life is to build great teams. So as you're starting your career, building great teams means finding people that you really like working with. Even if they're outside of the department that you're working in, you meet them in the break room and you feel like you have something in common with them. And so you start building relationships with people <clears throat> in the organization. The other part of this is surrounding yourself <clears throat> as you become a manager, surrounding yourself with people, smart people. I say people who are smarter than me. Most of the people who work for me are by far smarter than me in the disciplines that they work in. A lot of people ask me how I stay current on technology. And my answer is very simple. I go to happy hour <laughs> and I talk to my friends because over the years, uh, I've collected a, a group of really, really bright technology people who are passionate about being hands-on. I unfortunately am no longer hands-on in technology. I learn technology at a very high level, but I have people who are really passionate about it and still hands-on in it, who can give me good advice about what the right way to go is. So the interesting thing about building great teams is you would think that a great team is a collection of people who get along really well, and work well together. So one of the organizations that I worked in, we had a collection of people like that. And our manager thought, this is gonna be the best team that I have ever built because they're all these really smart type A people and I'm gonna bring them all together and we are gonna build great software. It was a horribly performing team and he couldn't figure out why. And someone suggested that he do personality profiles on the team. And so they administered personality tests. And the, the person who was administering the tests said, this is the strangest team I've ever seen. And so he showed the results sort of without names. Everyone on the team had the exact same personality profile. 
he said, if you want this team to perform, you need to split them up and you need to put people in there with different viewpoints and different thinking. Somebody who's going to challenge your ideas because you can never perform if you all think the same. And that's exactly what they did. They split that team into three and added a different mix of people and they became the three highest performing teams in the company. So as you look for people to surround yourself with, don't just look for people who think like you, surround yourself with people who think differently than you. Every year Catalyst does an employee survey and we ask people, are you happy at work? And, and but one of the, the things, one of the questions that's on there, and this is actually a standard question on employee survey, surveys is, do you have a best friend at work? So you spend at least eight hours of your day doing your job and you will become friends with the people there. And, you know, when I first saw it, I thought that's a really odd question. But most places you go, you will either have a best friend or somebody that will be some. They will call your work spouse that, you know, they're the people that you spend the most time with. And so it's, it's important to find people in your organization that you really enjoy spending time with. All right. So building great teams is number three. Number four is taking risks. So this one's kind of fun. When I say take risks, I mean both personally and professionally. I think the very first risk I took was in making the decision to go to graduate school. So neither one of my parents went to college. They, my dad was a blue collar worker. And so they were very pleased and very happy that I went to college and got my degree in, in math and computer science. And out of college, I was interviewing, had several job offers, both of them making more money than my dad had ever made. But I decided that I wanted to go to graduate school. And it was the first time I'd ever seen my parents disapprove of, of something that I had done. And I felt strongly enough about it to do it. And it's worked out great. And they, they admitted that as well at some point along the way. But I, I think that was the first significant risk that I took. And it's very hard to take those, those big risks. The thing you have to remember though, is that risks and opportunities are everywhere. So, so I wanna talk a little bit about opportunity and keeping your eye, eyes open for opportunities that might be out there for you. So one of the, the best things that ever happened to me in my career was that first job after IBM and going to work for that small consulting company. But the way that I ended up there was very strange. So at the time I was in North Carolina, my husband was actually still at the University of Illinois. So we were doing long distance and he was commuting to North Carolina. And as he was flying back on a plane, he sat next to a woman who he started a conversation with, who ended up being the manager at this, this consulting company. And she said, hey, we're hiring. You know, your wife sounds like a, a good candidate. Why don't you have her apply? I did. I ended up going to work there and it really has changed, dramatically changed the trajectory of my career. And that was that first move and taking that risk from going to a very well-established company to that smaller company. Um, but again, that was my first foray into financial services and it really did set the, set the tone for the rest of my career, which led to me starting my own company, which is the next risk I would encourage you to take. Whether it's your primary job or your side hustle, whatever it is, if you get the opportunity, go out in the world and start your own company. You will learn more from running your own company than probably anything else you do except raising kids, which is the most educational thing you will ever do in your entire life. Um, because you learn about managing money and managing time and accounting and marketing and you know lead generation and all these things that you may know nothing about, especially coming from a technology background. Um, I've, I've met a whole lot of entrepreneurs in my career and it takes a special breed of person to stay an entrepreneur and, and really be dedicated to that. But if, if that's something that you think you wanna do, I absolutely encourage you to do it because you will learn so much 
success or failure, you'll learn so much. So I'll tell you one more taking risk story. And this is a personal taking risk one because it's another one where I learned a tremendous amount. So both of my boys were Boy Scouts. My husband, who is an engineer, is not an outdoor person. So I was nominated to be the person who took my children to high adventure camp. And the first high adventure camp we did when they were 14 was canoeing in the boundary waters of Minnesota. So we prepared for this for probably six months, hiking with 30 and 40 pound packs, learning to canoe. We thought we were really prepared for this trek. And we got there, we met our trek guide, and we laid out, we had maps, paper maps all over the place, trying to figure out what the best route was for us, had it all laid out, and we did. We, we got into day one. And about two hours into day one, so if you don't know a whole lot about canoeing the boundary waters of Minnesota, there's two parts. There's the canoeing, which we were pretty prepared for. And there's this other part called portaging. So portaging is coming up to the shore, taking all of your gear, including all your canoes, and walking it across land to another lake on the other side of the land, because not all the lakes are connected. So we got to our first portage, and my boys were, all the boys on this were younger, younger scouts. So they were like a hundred pounds soaking wet and they were all carrying a hundred pounds of gear. So basically their body weight in gear, which left me to carry the canoe, which didn't seem like that big of a deal because it was actually way less than the rest of the gear. What I didn't realize was that you were supposed to carry the canoe on your head and to get it on your head, you were supposed to grab it with two hands and flip it up over your head. What I lacked was the upper body strength to do that. <laughs> and so I stood there, all of my team members had taken their packs and run because that's what they were told to do because it's easier to run with the weight than it is to walk. And so I stand there looking at my canoe thinking, no idea what I'm gonna do with this canoe. And I stood there for about 10 minutes. I tried various ways to pick it up and none of that worked. And fortunately, another crew came out of the, the woods from the other direction and helped me put the canoe on my head. And walking with it wasn't so bad until we got to a grade and it, there was just no way I was gonna finish this half a mile walk with this canoe. So I made it about halfway. And fortunately, our trek leader, figured that it wasn't going as well as it should and came back. Um, but we ended up having two choices on that trip. We could either pack it up and quit because we weren't prepared. We thought we were prepared. We weren't prepared. We could either pack it up and quit or we could change our goals <coughs> and change what we thought our trip was going to be, regroup and go out the next day. And so we ended that week we regrouped, we ended the week, we paddled over 70 miles. We only did three portages total. We picked very short ones, which meant we had to paddle a lot more than we portaged, which turned out to be a good thing for, for the people on the trek. But I took that same team to two other high adventure camps. And those were probably the three best years of being outdoors and building a team and watching people grow and learning from the challenges that we experienced. But it was definitely a risk and well out of my comfort zone. So the last thing I'll say on taking risks is I read a book with a, with a line, in them, line in it that I wish I would have read the, you know, when I started college. And it was Sheryl Sandberg's book called Lean In. And the question was, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And we've all felt it. We've all sat in a meeting or we've all sat in a room and we know we have a great idea and we know we should speak up, but we're afraid of what people will think and we're afraid of what people might say. And I take that to heart when, I, when I'm afraid to do something. This is, you know, speaking to a group of, of people. What would I do if I, if I wasn't afraid? 
And so it's a very powerful thought to keep in mind when you're afraid to do something. All right, so that's taking risks. Our next ingredient is fail. Failing is hard, but you will learn more from failing than you ever learn from your successes. I'm really good at most of what I do. I graduated valedictorian of my high school and college classes. All the performance reviews that I've had along the way have been great. And I had the opportunity to get my first C-level role. And I knew it was high risk because the company had had seven CIOs in five years. So I knew it was going to be a hard place to work, but I figured, hey, you know, I can do this. I've got this. So I went to work there and I worked there for nine months. And in that time, I moved their entire IT department from Atlanta to Dallas, 120 people. We moved their data center. We built a mobile app. We built a data warehouse and I got fired. So why did I get fired? Because I didn't know what my job was. I thought I knew what my job was. I thought my job was running a technology department because I had never had a C-level position before. And what I realized in hindsight was that my job was managing upward. My job was doing what my CEO wanted me to do, not doing what I knew needed to be done. And what he wanted, and what he always wanted, was someone to travel with him, fly back and forth every week from Dallas to Atlanta, to talk to him on his private plane. Not to do work, but, but really just to, to be there to listen to his ideas. And I missed it. I completely missed it. And I learned more about being a C-level executive from being fired than I would have learned implementing all kinds of really cool technology solutions at that company. And so it was very, very enlightening for me. It's very hard when you're going through failure to see out, through, out the other side. But when you look at it, looking back, it, it's much easier to, to understand what you learned. All right, and our last ingredient is own it. So own what, you ask? Let's start with own your career. I see this time and time again where people think that it's your manager's job to tell you what to do to get to the next level in your career. Nobody will care more about your career than you. If you have a good manager, they will help you, but seek out feedback. Even in your classes, seek out feedback, seek out constructive criticism and take it to heart. Always have at least one or two things that you are working on to get better at and know what those things are. If somebody asks you, what are those things that, that you're working on to get better? Every job interview will ask you, what's your biggest weakness? I have a great answer for that. It's project management. I am terrible at it. I, I, I go out and I hire the best project manager I can find. And I have a, a PMO uh, leader who's been with me for three companies now because he's great at it and he covers for my weaknesses. The next part of it is always have an updated resume and interview at least once a year, even if you have no interest in going to another job because you need to know what your market worth is. You need to know that you're still staying current in technology or with staying current with the skills that the marketplace wants, especially in technology because it changes so fast. You need to know what other companies are thinking, of, thinking out there. Another piece of advice is to dress for the position you want not the position you have. So figure out what's the next role in the organization that you want and pay close attention to the person who's in that role. Our CEO makes it very easy. He comes in in shorts. That's awesome. But I have had CEOs that they wore suits to work every day. And if I wanted that role, even if I wasn't in that role yet, I needed to wear a suit every day. 
because that's the west where you want to be, not where you are. The other piece of owning it is understanding influence and perception and the perception that people have of you. So a manager once told me that every meeting that you go into, the other people in the room will change their perception of you. It will either become better or it will become worse, but it won't stay the same. So if you go into a meeting and you don't say anything, the, their perception of them, your influence in that organization has decreased. Every meeting that you go into, you should have two agendas. Whatever the agenda is for the meeting and whatever your personal agenda is. What do I want to get out of this? Is my boss in there? Do I want my boss to know something that I'm working on that I don't think he's working on? Is there a business customer in there that I'd love to do work with that I really want to see me and hear me. So always think about before you go into a room, what do I, what am I trying to get out of this encounter? And it's, it's everything, right? It's a class, it's a meeting, it's lunch with a friend. You know, what are you trying to get out of it? All right. So that is our last ingredient. So we'll put it in there. We'll shake it up a little bit. And with those six ingredients, that's a big part of what I have learned over the last, and I hate to say it, over the last 30 years in my career. I've had a lot of experiences, some of them good, some of them bad, but all of them have been a lot of fun. And that's really the key is, if you're not having fun doing what you're doing every day, then figure out what it is because you're only going to be passionate about it if you're having fun. Don't do something that makes you miserable every day. You spend way too much time doing your job. It's, you know, more than anything else except maybe sleep. So find something that you love and that you really can see yourself doing. And, you know, your, your generation is going to have many careers. I think the average now is five you're gonna make five significant career changes along the way. So don't be afraid to make the career change. It's okay. It's okay to decide somewhere along the way that technology is not what you wanna do. I enjoy being a manager more than I enjoyed being a developer. I was good at being a developer. I was better at actually being a support person, but you know, management, I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about growing people. And so it keeps me coming back every day. Um, I think that's it. I do have one more poll if you guys want to do this. Let me see if, hold on, I think I have to start it. There, let's try that. So of these things that we talked about, which one do you think is most important? So failing. Failing is a big one. There's a fortune cookie or a napkin at one of the restaurants that I go to that talks about you, you don't know where the line is unless you step over it every once in a while. And stepping over the line is going to cause you to fail sometimes, but Failing and knowing why you're there. I like knowing why you're there too. All right, so questions. Anybody? Thank you so much for your interesting talk. Could you please answer the same question? Which, uh, which one do you think? Which one do I think is most important? Um, that's a great question. I think knowing why you're there. For me, that as I've gone through my career, especially at the point I'm, I'm at now, knowing why I'm doing what I'm doing is, is most important. When I was younger, owning it. And, and realizing that I was responsible for my own career and nobody was going to hand me 
that next role without me seeking it out. Thank you so much. <laughs> yep. Um, my contact is, information is here. Happy to connect on LinkedIn if you guys want to connect. Happy to answer questions if you want to send them over. And then if you want to go to the last one, that's yes. your, uh, yes, your survey. Definitely. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah, oh, they, they still absolutely. have questions. But as you're asking the question, please uh, do this survey. They just ask you uh, about this place to start, how good the talk was, and also there's a raffle at the end. Please record the number. I will give you the winners in a couple of minutes. And now you can ask your questions, yes. Thank you for the session. Uh, I have a question. So when you mentioned that you have to find people who think differently, what do you mean by that? So don't surround yourself with just technologists. So here, here, here's a great example. I told you I have two kids. They're actually identical twins. And one of them is right brain and one of them is left brain. So my left brain child forces the rest of the family to think differently because he views the world from more of a psychology perspective than he does a technology perspective. And I have a number of friends who are technical writers or psychology majors, and a lot of technology people end up marrying teachers, which is an interesting combination because it's that you know, technical and soft skills and it makes a good pair. So find people that, like I said, are, are look at the world differently than you do. Thank you. I have one more small question. Sure. So uh, while finding mentors, generally, like, uh, what do the mentors get I mean, uh, for staying connected so long? What's in that? A good mentor gets the pleasure out of watching you grow. And so a lot of times a good mentor is also a good teacher. In my case, he actually was a, a teacher. He taught object-oriented programming, and so he enjoys that role of teaching people new things. Um, I had a mentor who I learned a tremendous amount from. He was a terrible manager, so in some ways I learned what not to do from him. Um, but again, he had that passion for sharing his experiences, and I think that's what you're looking for is Somebody who's willing to share their experience and why they did what they did. Other questions? Dr. So, at some point, you are saying something about fear. So, you started here out of your college, right? At IBM. And you got all the way here, you are a CTO now. I assume when you started here, you're like, the world is at my feet, right? And I feel less. But at some point, fear starts to build in. And could you pinpoint the point where that happened and maybe why it happened? So that's a great question. Let me see. So, yes, you know, like I told you, I, I, I think. I think it's when you get to the point of being middle management. So as you're a developer, you know, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to write code with bugs in it, but it's the, the responsibility isn't all on you because there's a QA person who's supposed to test it and there's a business person who's supposed to test it. And if that bug gets into production, you all missed it, right? But as you start becoming responsible for making the bigger decisions, then it becomes more on you and you're more accountable for it. And therefore, that's where, that, that's where my fear started to come in, is when I owned whole products. I was, <laughs> we, we built a check processing project and we had $80 million at risk one night. I was on a phone call with the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and I was the person on the call speaking. And that level of responsibility and knowing that you know people can lose their houses because their rent, their mortgage check doesn't get where it's supposed to go. That's where the fear comes from. 
uh, you mentioned about like staying back uh, for the work that is there and not just the manager. But maybe someone who's in the management, what do you say that? I mean, don't you think a manager probably would, uh, I mean, uh, act as a mentor and help you to get through the work and get you, uh, I mean, uh, help you getting to know about the work around it? How important do you think uh, that is against? Uh, you know, they love it for your uh, work mind. Um, so let me see. Say, ask your question one more time because I'm not sure. I'm... Uh, so you mentioned that, I mean, uh, compared to uh, just aiming back for a good manager, you should always stay back uh, for the work that you're doing there. Yes. So how much, what's the percentage of you agree? Because uh, you are yourself being in the management, wouldn't you like someone to stay back because of who you are as a mentor? Then? So the question is is really, I think, you know, you like the work, you either like the manager and don't like the work, or you like the work, but not the manager, and, and how do you know? How do you know when to stay? So here's a great example in my career. I, I spent six years working for a CEO who was very mean, <laughs> but he was brilliant. And so I had to balance every day, am I getting more out of this role than I'm putting into? Because I learned more about being a great manager from him than I learned from anybody else in my career. But there was a point one day where the stress and the, the, the bad feeling about myself at the end of the day wasn't worth what I was learning anymore. And so that was what, that's that's when you, you feel like you need to leave. And I have a question. So I'd like to know what your plans are for the future. You have worked for 30 years. So how long do you think you'll be in this job and what do you plan to do in the future? How many years? It's actually something that I, I've been thinking about a lot lately because I'm now an empty nester. So my children are out of the house. I have all this extra free time, right? And so what is my next career? Yeah. Um, I think that I, I see two paths, two mm -hmm. possible paths. One is I really would like to do that C CEO role. Mm -hmm. Our CEO has got four to five years left on his time horizon. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a path that, that I could see myself going down. I think there's still things to learn there. Honestly, I like education. And so if I decide, I, my husband is older than I am, and so he, he'll retire in the next few, few years. Um, my next career may be teaching and, and getting back into being more hands-on and interacting with students and things like that. So I don't know. Yeah, because I'm still going to see that. I've been working for 43 years, mm -hmm. and my husband is eight years older, so we're in a similar situation, and he's ready to retire next year. Yep. And so, you know, and I, I've been in commercial industry, my corporation, US government, and then to tenure professors at India. It's very really hard to leave a tenured position and go elsewhere. So it's something that, you know, I've been here now for 19 years. And I can't see myself you know, doing anything else, but still, I don't know. I'm sort of. What would you do if you weren't afraid? I don't know. Ask yourself that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. What is an employee to get into executive wage? Like, what has to focus on them? So the question is, what to, to get to an executive position? Um. Start by being great at the technology. Start by being being the best at every role that you're in, and you'll get noticed. But again, don't don't be afraid to help yourself get noticed. The hardest transition you'll ever make in your career is the transition from an individual contributor to a manager. It's very easy to get job satisfaction when you're a developer. You create some code, you get it done, and you feel really good. When you're a manager, you get your job satisfaction by seeing your employees grow. And there's no instant gratification. And it is the hardest transition you'll ever make. And some people, it makes some people miserable. 
they, they miss that instant gratification. And that's okay. I, some of my best people have no interest whatsoever in being managers. They are architects and they are leads and they can lead people, but they don't want to be managers. So you have to you have to decide what's important to you. So uh, you had mentioned about starting a company and taking your risks. So if you do have an idea and you want to move forward with something, then how would we typically plan our day? And then in case we have to take difficult situations, then how would we overcome that decision making process? Like how would we just make our product day productive and our goals progress? I don't know if I have a great answer for this one. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities now that didn't exist when, when I was young and looking at starting companies in terms of incubators and seed money and things that are available to get you started. Um, those are things that I would look, look for, but I, I've met 19 year olds in Frisco who started, a, one in particular who impressed me to know him every time I talked to him. He, at 19, he started a company with $500 and an idea. And he built some software, a proof of concept, and he started knocking on doors of credit unions and saying, hey, is this something that, is this something you guys would be interested in? And they all said no. But they gave him feedback on why they said no. And he didn't let them out of the room until they gave him some sort of feedback on making it better. And he's now got a company that's worth probably 15 or 20 million dollars. And I think he's 23 now. And so it's it's really being willing to put yourself out there and taking the feedback and putting it back into your product. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys for letting me I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, so I'm, you are in tech and finance, two of the most main dominated. <coughs> So can you say something about uh, being a female, being a female executive all your, throughout your career? So do you, can you say anything about that? Yeah, I can say lots about that. <laughs> but th this is the one thing I, I would like you women in the, in the audience to take away is, I don't think of myself as a woman in STEM. I think of myself as someone who's really good at technology who happens to be a woman. I've spent my entire career being the only woman in the room. And I am thrilled to see all of, all of the young women in this room. Uh, there were five women out of 150 people in my master's graduating class. Um, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you that it's been easy all, all along the way. I mean, there, there has definitely been challenges, but you have to believe that you're good at what you do. And you have to have the confidence to believe in what you're saying and doing. And if you have that confidence and you're willing to stand up for your ideas, then people will recognize that. And you'll just be another person in the room and not you know, a woman in instead. Thank you so much. Thank you.